Okay, we're recording. So welcome everyone to um, the ninth week of OLS2. This is a call on self-care and ally skills. Um, so we also have, uh, as well as myself and Malvika, we have two fantastic co-hosts who will be helping us with the ally skills section. So say hello to Hao and to Emmy. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so as a reminder for anyone who's just arrived, this call is being recorded. Um, and we will, I'll just quickly go over the code of conduct. Uh, so as a reminder, we have a code of conduct with Open Life Science. This applies both uh, within this call and with any interactions that you may have within the community, such as on Slack or on the GitHub um, repositories. Uh, generally, this means that we want everyone to treat each, each other with respect and the way that you would like to be treated by others. Um, if at any point you feel like you may have witnessed or experienced something that isn't in line with the code of conduct, then you can report that to team at openlifesci.org. That reaches myself, Malvika and Berenice. And it also, um, if you, if at any point, actually it's one of us who's done this and you don't want to contact the group email, you can contact us individually. So our email addresses are all over on page three. So that's Berenice at openlifesci.org, Malvika at openlifesci.org or Yo at openlifesci.org. Um, so, Oh yeah, final reminder, I think, before we actually start talking about the self-care section, um, is that we are using Google Doc today rather than HackMD, unfortunately, just because it seems to have load issues. Um, it's a great problem to have when we have 40 people in the call and that's too many for HackMD, but it does mean that the document was slow and Google Doc seems to deal with load a little bit better. Um, anything else to include or shall I, shall I hand it over to you, Malvika? Sounds good. So generally you would uh, not see you and me presenting, but we thought that this topic is something that we really, really care about. And we want to present it in a way that you understand it for your community, but you also understand it from the perspective of OLS team, because we would really like you to take care of yourself. And we would really like to remind you that we are in the middle of the program. We have given you a lot to learn and work on, including assignments and it's okay if you haven't done those. Uh, the important part is for you to remember that we are here to teach you and show you some of the practices that we believe will be beneficial for you going forward throughout your life. So look at it that way that you will come back to these topics in your own time. So the topic, uh, which is called personal ecology, it's been perhaps coined by Akaya Winwood. Uh, Akaya Winwood was a leadership instructor in Rockwood Leadership Institute, um, which she's running her own consulting now. Uh, while she was there, uh, she talked about self-care from a perspective that self-care could be a privilege when you can step back from your life and work and uh, take care of yourself. But self-care shouldn't be missed when you are building a community. Uh, there's a quote that I have added in the notes, which says that part of my responsibility as a community leader and member is to care for my being, understanding that my well-being is connected to your well-being. I want you to be well, so we are well. And I think this is where you have to understand that self-care is not a selfish thing to do. Self-care is something that is very important to do. So with that, a little pep talk, I'm going to share my screen. So let's start with the topic that a lot of you might know, self-care. It is about taking care of ourselves so we can contribute to the work that inspires and fulfills us, irrespective of where we are. Self-care can be in the context of work. It could also be in context of home. Whereas personal ecology is to maintain balance, spacing, and efficiency in, to sustain our energy over a prolonged time. Personal ecology is something which is planned and strategized because this is to ensure that what you are doing, the work that really brings joy to you can be maintained throughout. So personal ecology is a part of a broader ecosystem. We can't have a healthy community if we individually are burned out, especially right now, which uh, when we are working from home, 
it is very difficult for us to draw a line between work and home because we're working at home. And burnout can be experienced by anybody. You're not susceptible, you, you're not immune to that. So burnout is often characterized in the occupational context by feelings and energy depletion or exhaustion. It is increased mental distance or feeling of negativism related to job, and it has reduced professional efficiency as a consequence of stress from work. Even though it's characterized at occupational level, it has a broad personal consequences if we don't address them or we don't recognize them. Personal ecology is a, is a plan for yourself and your community need for a proactive, strategic, and systemic approach. And now when we say these big, big words, it sounds like huge work. Uh, so the big idea is that we want to identify what makes our environment more fulfilling and how can we sustain them. Also identify what is not fulfilling and what can frustrate me and avoid them. So this is a prompt that we shared with you uh, before this call. So with that, I'll ask you to take a couple of minutes to think about three word pairs. Uh, three word pair that describes your most fulfilling day. So here are my word pairs. My word pairs are positive interaction, idea exchange, and finishing something. And three word pair that is most unfulf unfulfilling for me are when I have negative interaction, if I feel stuck, or I have a very repetitive schedule where I don't have time for creativity. So with that, I'll uh, stop sharing for a couple of minutes. You can take the time to reflect and write that down on the notes where you will see these prompts. For those joining from mobile phone, you can also use the Zoom chat. It's fine not to take notes on the Google Doc. So I'll start reading some of those and I'll, I'm loving those. So we have uh, problem solving, supporting others, big picture in positive, positive interactions, welcoming environment, communicating ideas, group bra brainstorming. I love that too, quite a lot. Tangible output, new ideas, connecting people, helping people, finishing task, learning new, learning something new, um, positive communication, unblocking others, forward looking, quiet time, I love that too. Please don't stop writing, these are for you. These are really important things to think about, think about because you can recognize them when they happen at your work. 
I'm also going to read some unfulfilling experiences, uh, demeaned or spoken down to, arguing, losing faith and interest in work and goals, no concentration, unreasonable blocking, stuck, feeling stuck, no focus, poor exchange. Um, we have overloaded schedule, unfruitful communication, unmotivated colleagues, feeling isolated, physically tiring, slow progress, negative feedback. We have no progress, repetition, isolation, excessive multitasking, unproductive discussion, overcommitment, distraction spiral. That's so true. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, this could be very therapeutic, but also quite challenging when you haven't really taken time to think about them. So this is really something that you would like to do on a weekend with a very good coffee and sit down and think about them for your own record. So personal ecology starts with ensuring your own well-being and availability for yourself, those you care for and work. So if you have the feeling that taking care of myself is quite selfish, uh, because I should be working and I should be doing something for others. But I think it is more about positive, positive interaction you can have with other people at work. So you're really doing favor on others when you are taking care of yourself. And then you can actually make space for others to do the same. So if you would like for others to take time for themselves, you have to set an example by doing it for yourself. I have given a handout uh, in the uh, notes. I will not ask you to open that now because it's quite a huge handout and I think it takes quite a lot of time. It depends on how fast, how slow you want to go with it. But I'll give you a quick overview before I uh, finish and I ask you to reflect upon them. Uh, this will allow you to assess your personal ecology habit and draw inspiration to create personal plan on a long term. This can also be transferred into your project. So currently you're building this plan for yourself. But when you're in a space where you feel that you have taken care of yourself, you can start helping others build their plan within your community. So the first part you will look at in the handout would be about the work-life quadrant snapshot. This work-life quadrant would ask you four questions. Things at work that I want to keep at work. Second is things at work that I want to bring into my life. Third is things in my life I want to keep outside work. And finally, things in my life I want to bring into my work. So these are, you can think about it as uh, four uh, boxes in the table where you will be thinking about each of them. So you can actually define a very clear boundary between your work and home to avoid burnout. The burnout happens when you start uh, leaking things across your work and life. So main questions for, for this quadrant snapshots are, what do, you, what do your responses show you about your work-life balance? Do you actually want to maintain that? Or do you have willingness to start doing that? Where do you see opportunities to bring things into your life from your work and vice versa? So kindness is something that I see that you have to have in both places. That cannot stay to one place or other. Can you see something like that that you would like to uh, bring into your work or at your home? How might you set boundaries around the things you don't want to bring back and forth? It's okay to tell your colleagues if uh, something you do not feel very comfortable about. Um, just because you're setting a boundary doesn't mean you're being, again, uh, selfish or demeaning to others. Second set of questions you would find in your handout would be delights and distractions snapshot. This also would relate back to what you just did about finding fulfilling and most unfulfilling things. So this is a way for you to create a delightful, engaging, remote and distributed work, workspace that doesn't unduly distract you from your work and your engagement with your colleague. So in your delight, you would write, oh, when I work and I listen to a very good song, I can concentrate more. In my break, during my day, I would like to read a chapter from my book, uh, or I would like to, to watch 10 minutes of a movie. Maybe you don't want to watch a movie during your work, but things that keep you motivated. Where, where at your home you're working right now, what kind of food you're eating, 
this is definitely for you. What kind of snuggly blanket she has? Do you have a debugging duck if you're feeling isolated and you really need someone's help to debug your code? Same for your distra uh, distraction. Sometimes you can have an inconsistent document format that can make you feel very distracted. So you would like to bring some sort of uh, format into your work. If you work in a place which is extremely cluttered or dirty, or you don't really have space to pay attention to your work but get distracted, you would also like to fix that. Also feeling out of place and isolated can be very difficult. So how can you have engagement with your colleague? Can you find some ways to connect with them during your work? Finally, you would have compare and contrast exercise. Again, it is for your own time. So you would like to compare the current state of your personal ecology with its contrast, your desired state. So you know what to work towards to improve your self-care plan. So there are several questions. Some of them are, for example, what is your work-life balance like right now? How would you like to, uh, uh, sorry, what, how do you know? So you would like to reflect on this question. You would put some indicators that will remind you of uh, why, what it looks like. Then how do you want your work-life balance to be, which is a contrast question. What would you have to change for it to be that way? So as you can see that these are questions that you can't answer over this training call in two or three minutes. This is really about sitting down and doing self-interrogation. So before I close and ask you to take another five minutes to reflect on some of these questions, I would like you to uh, think about anything you would like to share with the group about your self-care tips or your responses to the activities today. So this is very altruistic. You want other people on the call to take care of themselves. That's why maybe you would like to share something with them. For yourself, you would like to think about an immediate next step you can take to sustain yourself, your personal ecology or your work-life balance. Finally, I would also say you can identify your accountability buddy. This doesn't have to be a human. This could be an online channel, an app that you're using, but, but a human would be definitely much more interactive. Uh, who can help you to take these steps and what would they need to know? So with these three prompts, I'm gonna stop and open the floor for some questions, and then we can go for five minutes reflection exercise. Any immediate question we can discuss here? It's okay to unmute yourself uh, today. We have been on time, so you won't <laughs> take extra time. Yeah. We also have some uh, stuff happening in the notes. So Outline 164 for me. Got it. Uh, how does everyone treat OLS tasks, either work or life task? I have moved it into, oh, people are actually answering those. Uh, does someone want to reply by unmuting themselves? So I can talk a little bit. It's something where, because I recently redid my goals for like the year. Um, and I realized that my goals for the year, like professionally and personally, haven't actually changed at all. But that I, in my work life, I have moved no closer towards them. Um, and so, but with OLS, is that I started to weight more heavily what I was doing, because this is something that moves me closer to where I want to be personally and professionally three years five years and ten years um and so like being able to align that and the things that I'm doing um kind of helped me understand and place it so I took this as a as a life thing um but that's just my where I weighted it personally <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, people's engagement are quite different. Uh, when I had joined a similar program like this, I basically took my work project to join and therefore it was my work. 
Um, but when we were developing open life science, it was not exactly related to my work, but I had to find an alignment that Sophia just explained that I was doing open science and therefore anything that I was doing was a good application of my skill. But I see that a lot of people are using it as their personal non-work related. Oh, I'm so sorry that you're, you feel that your supervisor um, might not understand it. Um, that's that's something that can happen but i'm sure once you have something to show and if you share with your supervisor i hope they'll be happy to see your progress and yes yo so i just wanted to share that when i first did mozilla open leaders in 2017 i definitely did not tell my work um, because i knew that they wouldn't approve of it because it wasn't focused on the grant work that i was doing uh, so it was absolutely outside work um, what i found was that anyway i was able to bring some of the skills that i learned in to what i was doing at work and um, i kind of like like you mentioned there's a little bit of a not really telling some people sometimes um, to avoid the embarrassment or to avoid that, well, this isn't on, tar on target, is it? But it doesn't mean that you can't actually still use those lessons really beneficially and really usefully when, in your work later on. Uh, so I think I probably wouldn't be joking when I say that I massively, massively changed how I work. So like I, I already worked on an open source project, um, but it got a lot opener just based on the stuff that I learned. So I don't feel too bad it can still be helpful and useful um, even if it's something that you don't feel like it can be part of your work life officially um so what i'll say the let's take next four minutes to uh, go back to this part where it says any reflection thoughts or ideas you would like to share with others here i would like to take some time for you to think back of any step or tips that you apply to your life to make it a lot more self-caring that you think other people can benefit from. So I think this is a way for you to recall that habit and also for other people to adapt that in their life. So that would be our quiet note-taking four minutes.
Okay. Um, please keep writing that. You can always come back to it and read and you know expand everything you're writing. Um, but this is the next part of our call today, which is super exciting. So I'll hand it over to Hao and Amy. Wait, so do we start now? Sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, just before uh, Hao is going to do a, an introduction on the following hour, um, if I could please ask everyone to uh, indicate whether you'd like to participate in a written or spoken discussion room later um, by changing um, your name on Zoom so that uh, the way to do that is to hover over your own image on Zoom. There is three dots on the top right. Um, click that and there will be a rename option. And then you can put either S for spoken or W for written. Um, it will really help us organize this later. Um, so if you could just, once you've <laughs> reflected and typed your thoughts down on the Google Doc. Um, do that within the next couple of minutes. That would be great. Yeah, so what's E? <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, so yeah, try to stick to the spoken or written, please. Um, if you, you know, if next time, you can always switch. Between, you know, we, we you're starting to realize that we have these discussion sessions almost every single call. And so, you know, if you have want to try something different next time, that's strongly encouraged as well. But you try and pick an option for today, that would be helpful. Thank you. Oh, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, so for the next hour, um, Emmy and I are going to talk about ally skills and this will going to be an interactive discussion. Uh, involving the breakout rooms. So thank you for going ahead and indicating your preference for either the spoken discussion or written discussion rooms. Uh, this material that we're going to present has been adapted from Frameshift Consulting, uh, which is a group that uh, offers training for organizations and companies on ally skills uh, that we have all participated in, although I think at different times. Um, and the materials from the slides are available by Creative Commons, uh, by Share Alike. Okay, so ally skills are about using our collective societal advantages for good and what does that actually entail? So this, uh, this session that we're doing for OLS um, is really just an introduction to some of the principles um, and a little bit of an exercise to get you familiar with what allyship is about. Um, the typical workshop is a three or four hour long workshop, uh, I believe, um, there have been postings in the Slack about uh, two different events coming up uh, that you can register for as part of OLS. Um, and so this is really just kind of a brief introduction to that. Um, definitely, we want to encourage that allyship is not about, it's not something that I think you can just attend you know, one training or one seminar and feel like you are like, you know, that you have mastered it completely. Um, it's really, I think, a perspective uh, that you continue to grow and develop um, and gain experience in. So it's definitely a skill that benefits from having more and more practice, uh, which is why 
part of the session involves an interactive activity and why a lot of the workshop involves different kinds of uh, group discussions and experiencing different scenarios. Uh, this material is not uh, intended to be a complete workshop or a certification or uh, a way to um, rectify any past issues. Uh, so definitely um, we encourage people to attend, but it's, you know, want to be explicit that it is voluntary and not a like mandatory uh, kind of training uh, that in the vein of human resources training often is. Uh, we are not representing our various employers or providing legal advice. And the context for these materials and the discussion is that we assume we are aware of biases and oppression in society. And we're all here because we're interested in learning how to be better at allyship. And so in that vein, we are not going to discuss whether oppression exists, whether different kinds of oppression are good or bad, uh, or whether they should be stopped or not, uh, just that we are all, you know, we agree or for the sake of the, you know, the discussion and what we want to do that uh, we want to use our privileges to dismantle systems of oppression. So the brief format, so we are going to do some short introduction with the slides. Uh, there will be a bit of warm up uh, that Emmy will lead the uh, group discussion and the breakout rooms, uh, and then we'll gather back so that uh, you can learn from uh, each other and the individual groups will be reporting what they discussed and what their conclusions were, and you'll be able to learn from each other kind of and see what those different perspectives were about to those scenarios. So what are what is an ally? So we need to define some of the terms. So privilege, uh, which is something I've already briefly mentioned, uh, is an unearned advantage that is given by society to some people, but not all. And oppression is a systemic pervasive inequality that is present throughout society. And it benefits people with more privilege and harms those with fewer privileges. In addition to that, a target is someone in your community or, work or workplace who suffers from oppression or is a member of some kind of marginalized group. And someone who is an ally is taking conscious actions um, and enjoys some societal advantages and works to understand their own privilege and step up for others. So here we want to focus that on the fact that uh, being an ally is not about um, having specific views about privilege or oppression, but really about uh, taking action, um, both in response to situations as they occur, as well as proactive actions to make your community or your workplace or your environment uh, more inclusive and to uh, decrease the kinds of oppression that are occurring. So some kinds of privileges, um, there are many, many uh, categories. Uh, there are also categories of uh, power uh, that uh, we can, that are, that are related but are a little bit different and include um, different kinds of aspects that may be partially earned, such as education. Uh, you do have to work to get your degrees, uh, but there are also privileges in having access to education and the ability to afford education in various ways. Um, and there are a lot of different kinds of privilege that aren't always uh, readily visible or commonly expressed. Uh, so as an example, I am a US citizen uh, and I work in the academic system in the US. Um, and that means that a lot of funding opportunities for research are available to me because of, uh, because of those qualities. Um, and that's not true for all of my colleagues because there are international researchers 
who cannot, for instance, be the principal investigator on certain kinds of funding opportunities. Uh, and so that definitely is a barrier and something to think about uh, when I consider, um, you know, doing research or collaborating with people and how I want to include people on projects. Some basics of ally skills. Um, we really emphasize that uh, it's important to respond in the moment if an incident occurs um, so that you can interrupt the harm that is happening. Um, responding afterwards is also great. Um, we just wanna make sure that that action actually does happen and realize that um, having that like response in the moment is very challenging if you are not ready for it, uh, which is why our workshops focus on practicing scenarios so that you can develop those reflexes to respond in the moment. Uh, we definitely emphasize that short responses are great. Um, so even uh, expressions of your emotional state like yikes or whoa or that's not okay. Uh, those are all perfectly acceptable responses because again, we want to interrupt the harm when it's occurring. Uh, if you are on social media, you may see various kinds of responses uh, that are intended to be funny, but end up uh, oppressing other groups. Uh, so for instance, um, you know, making comments on physical attractiveness or disability uh, when someone is uh, being homophobic or racist or sexist online, for instance. Uh, we don't want you to do any <laughs> of that kind of thing. So I encourage you to not try and be funny and focus on the harm that is occurring and the, the behavior and trying to stop the behavior. Uh, so yeah, so those are kind of the, the basics of responding as an ally. And some of the motivations for why allyship is important and why we need allies is that uh, when someone is a member of uh, a minority group or an oppressed group and they try to stand up for themselves, uh, they get penalized um, and they get retaliated against. And it's that the setting those, the, the boundaries in you know, workplace settings uh, can be seen as self-serving in a way that doesn't occur if it's someone from a majority group uh, who is uh, you know, intervening on behalf of someone else. So having the privilege to respond and not be penalized uh, is an important aspect of being an ally um, and those privileges can vary from situation to situation, uh, but it's an important reason why allyship is needed and why we can't just rely on the, you know, the people who have, uh, have issues to speak up when those issues are occurring. Uh, in addition to that, uh, in general, allies are members of groups that have more power and influence. They're often in the majority in different environments and workplaces. Uh, they're not penalized for that behavior. They have more time and energy. Uh, they can't be accused of jealousy. Um, and uh, they're seen as altruistic, giving, and kind when they behave in uh, an ally capacity. So there is um, an aspect of allyship that involves using the correct terminology um, and about not using euphemisms for different kinds of racial categories or gender categories or um, other categories that uh, involve the systems of oppression. Um, and there is a whole handout that has an explanation of terms uh, these terms are constantly changing um, and also vary from individual to individual. So you do want to be, you know, kind of aware that depending on who you talk to, um, uh, who you're interacting with, that the individual terms 
uh, may have uh, may be harmful or may not be harmful. Uh, an example of this uh, is the word queer um, in reference to um, the LGBTQ community. Um, in different circles, queer has been reclaimed and is no longer uh, a term that causes offense, uh, but in other cases, it is still considered harmful by people. So you do want to be aware of that and know how to respond and apologize when you make mistakes. Uh, and again, when you're trying to help one group and respond, uh, it's important to, to be aware that you are not inadvertently, um, you know, diverting that harm to a different group. Okay. Uh, this material is, uh, can be a little bit um, personal and difficult to engage with, uh, which is why we also include some pictures of cute animals for your distraction. So I'll stay on here for a little bit of time and I guess pause if there are any questions that people have and you would like to speak up or put them in the chat. The dog is actually my dog. I, I tried to get Malvika and Emmy and Yo to put their pet photos in, but I don't I don't know if any of those made it, made it into the slides. I'm gutted that I missed the chance to show more cat pictures to people. <laughs> well, there are there are you know like eight or nine more weeks, right? So I like your thinking. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I mentioned before that uh, you do want to make sure you know how to apologize if you inadvertently cause harm. Um, you know, it definitely happens when you use terminology or when you intervene in scenarios. Um, we want to make sure that um, the fear of making a mistake and causing harm is not something that is an obstacle to you acting uh, your and using your ally skills. So again, also practicing responses to making mistakes is very important. So when you do make a mistake, uh, focus on apologizing, correcting yourself and moving on. Um, one thing to really avoid is to not center your feelings uh, in the moment when you make a mistake uh, and instead to wait until your own time to engage in that self-care. Um, so statements like, I didn't mean it that way, shifts the focus from your action that caused the harm caused the harm and onto your feelings that you need to be reassured that you're not a bad person because you made a mistake. Uh, similarly, uh, you don't want to shift responsibility to the victim. So statements like, I'm sorry you were offended, um, shifts the, the focus of the mistake from your action that caused the mistake and onto the person who is offended. Uh, and that's, again, not something you want to do. So simple apologies. I'm sorry I did this. Uh, I won't do it again. Um, and not making, uh, you know, uh, a big emotional deal about uh, your own feelings about it and addressing your mistakes uh, later on your own time um, as appropriate. So I think at this point, uh, Emmy is going to take over with the group discussions. It's the usual drill of looking for the mute button. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Hal, for the introduction. Um, as um, you mentioned, we're going to go into group discussions. So um, there's some bit of instructions, so just please bear with me. Uh, we're going to have group discussions for 15 minutes. Um, and um, then after 
you know, you'll be in breakout rooms and then afterwards uh, you come back to the main room and each group will have two minutes to report back on what you've discussed. So um, the discussion is going to be centered around a scenario. What does that look like? So here's a test one. Um, it uh, may not be easy, <laughs> but, but we just sort of want you to get you thinking about how you would apply your ally skills and what would you do with an ally um, when you face a situation like this. So um, what we would like you to do as a group is, you know, read the scenario, um, think about uh, your actions, your considerations, discuss with one, one another, and then come up with sort of responses that you would, you would take as an ally. Um, and so as before with other uh, OLS cohort calls, uh, you'll have uh, written and spoken breakout rooms. Um, so thank you all for indicating your preference there. Uh, so we, this is a bit complicated to explain. We have two different scenarios for you to discuss, but each group will only discuss one. So there will be five breakout rooms. So you're either written or spoken and you'll either be discussing scenario one or scenario two. When you enter the breakout room, it will tell you what you, which mode of discussion you should be in and which scenario you should be discussing. So that's kind of clear. Um, so if you are in a um, speaking room, here are some tips uh, for you. Um, do be mindful of who is speaking most in your group. Is someone having difficulty being heard? Are some of these patterns related to gender, race, age, or anything else? Um, just sort of keep these questions in your head and try to, um, when you uh, notice that someone is not being heard, invite them into the conversation, for example. Um, if you know at some point there is a comment or responses that make you feel uncomfortable, uh, these are some of the easy responses that you can say. Um, and these are also ally skills as well, actually, but you can apply them in your discussion if that happens. So again, for the spoken rooms, um, we like to ask you to choose a gatekeeper. So this is a person that um, will try to uh, have say facilitate a good discussion by making sure that people aren't talking too much or too little. So um, ask people who aren't talking as much if they'd like to speak and interrupt people who are speaking too much. So please choose your gatekeeper. And then also perhaps more importantly, choose someone to report out at the end. So try and take notes and, and of your discussion to be prepared for reporting out and sharing with the rest of the, the cohort um, when you finish. Um, and then, sorry, forget about that last point. <laughs> so um, in the written rooms instead, uh, you will find on the Google Doc, um, there are three uh, prompts. So we ask, what are the biases, stereotypes, or assumption in the particular scenario? What will your response be as an ally and what are your concerns, if any? So um, we'd just like you to, you know, read the scenarios and then answer those prompts one by one by, by typing in the section below each of those prompts. Um, thank you, Mavika, who is very helpfully <laughs> adding group members, which I completely forgot about onto the uh, Google Doc. But yeah, please, if you could um, um, put in that information as well, that'd be great. So yeah, as I said, uh, the text of the scenario is on the Google Doc. For me right now, it's around scenario one's text. I'll put it in the chat as well. But scenarios, scenario one's text is around line 3307. Um, and scenario two's is around 343. Uh, I'll put it in the chat. Do we have, is, is that super confusing? Can someone please let me know? <laughs> If you have any questions, either in the chat or um, if you could unmute yourself. So here's scenario one. 
in the chat. And two, and you should be able to find the, for the written rooms, um, you'll be breakout groups one and four by number. Um, you should be able to find your relevant sections in the Google Doc. Um, group one for me is at line 300 and 311, and group four, which is the other written room, is at 360. Um, so I hope nobody is super confused. <laughs> uh, I will put you into room now. rooms now. You'll have 15 minutes. Great job, Emmy. And thank you so much, Hal. That was such a great presentation. You should stop recording. I will. Oh, thank you, whoever resumed the recording. <laughs> it's like magic. Um, yeah, so you, uh, I hope everyone had a, a fruitful discussion. Um, we will start the reporting out. I think I'd start with scenario one um let's start with i see the the spoken room is still typing their notes i'll try and quickly summarize uh what i'm reading here from the written breakout group so let me just start by reading the scenario so scenario one is on a professional mailing list that you belong to a colleague who came out as trans last semester starts a discussion in the response thread, another person repeatedly misgenders them by using incorrect pronouns. What would you do as an ally? So breakout group one um, at, uh, look, looked at the sort of biases and stereotypes um, assumptions that are in the scenario. Um, and they, uh, sort of looked at the, the offender's mindset and said maybe the off offender was thinking that the trans person's identity isn't real somehow. And so that's why the offender has misgendered the trans person. Um, and uh, maybe the offender has not appreciated the importance of the trans colleague coming out. Um, or maybe they didn't even know about it. And um, it's the response that are being typed as well. So uh, as they have responses around emailing the whole list um, as an ally and asking the offender to abide by the code of conduct for the list bracket. Hopefully there is one, which is really true. Um, and if there's a code of conduct contact point, then she can use that. Um, alternatively, email the offender separately. And then concerns uh, retaliation from the offender, especially if they have power over, over themselves. Um, and then also touched on, they, the group touched on derailing the discussion away from whatever the first colleague initially wanted to talk about. Um, so I think those are all really uh, valid um, uh, concerns and, and responses. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll get everyone to dive into it a little bit later after we've heard from the other group as well. So I wonder, uh, group two, um, if you could, the, the note taker, if you could spend about two minutes reporting on what you've discussed, whether you agree with group one or if you have similar responses. Sure, sorry, I did not do as good a job at note taking as I um, had hoped I would. Um, Broadly, I think we agreed. We, uh, we ended up going down a, a slightly different path of um, discussion. Um, I think for, for me, I would have gone through a process. It, it would have been quite important to me what my judgment on whether the mistake was, um, I guess, an honest mistake or with malicious intent. And that, that is a tricky thing to, to work out. But perhaps in the scenario, I might have kind of personal relationships that I could draw on to help to, um, to reach that understanding. Um, 
we talked about the kind of the pros and cons of um, responding privately or publicly. And one thing that I hadn't really thought about before was that um, if the response were to be private, then that misses the opportunity to, um, I guess, signal within that space that that was inappropriate behavior going forwards and that responding privately risks the situation that people might not feel safe in that space going forwards. Um, I thought that was very, a very valuable insight. Thank you, Danny. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, I think you both groups came like mentioned some really important points. So, uh, Danny, you mentioned that you know there needs to be uh, probably a public response, and the other the written group also mentioned that they will go for with a public response, and that's important because if as an ally we don't point that out on a in a public space, everyone on else on the list who's seen the misgender the misgenderation, the misgendering will think that, you know, this behavior is normal. And so there is a need for everyone to see a response. Um, it is, it could be uncomfortable for you uh, or to confront this person. Um, and it could also be uncomfortable for the trans person too, but it is in general a much more uncomfortable experience for the person who is being misgendered. So um, there is a comment from the written group saying that, you know, maybe you could contact this person, uh, the, the person, uh, the, both uh, the offender privately, if you uh, know them, um, that could be a good idea, you know, just as Danny has said, you know, just to see if that was an intentional, um, but make sure that you make the point that the trans person has stated that their pronouns are their, their pronouns, whatever they are, and that we should respect each uh, other people's pronouns. And the other thing is, you know, it may be helpful, it may be good to just reach out to the trans person so that they can advise you on how much you should escalate the issue so that it's done in a way that doesn't put any additional effort on them. So I think that's that's a really, really good um, tip. So just to say, you can say, I plan to respond with X message by date. If you'd rather I didn't, please let me know. Um, does anyone have any questions regarding the scenario or thoughts, folks from the other discussion group who's just had the discussion as well? Are there any, I'm just gonna leave sort of a 10 second space for questions. Comments? I think the group three were also discussing the scenario. Ah, sorry, my mistake. <laughs> Three, if you could please let us know um, what your thoughts are. Hi, everyone. Um, so we largely had similar responses to um, groups one and two. Um, I think we initially came at it with um, kind of the assumption that it could be unintentional um, and thought that privately messaging them would be the first thing we would do. Um, although we all recognized that a public message would also be important and then also in a separate mailing list thread asking people to use uh, to state their preferred pronouns in their email signatures or somewhere. Um, we also talked about um, adding um, and refreshing the community guidelines if there are some which I know group two also mentioned um, so that this kind of thing is kind of safeguarded uh, from happening again in future. Um, we did note, uh, but this is going with the assumption that there were no, um, there was no maliciousness behind the, the repeated misgendering. Um, I don't think we went as far as to discuss what would happen if we thought they were being malicious and just ignoring um, the thing completely. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. I. Miss, miss, I forgot my own breakout rooms. <laughs> I think but, Kendra. Sorry, yep. Kendra. 
Oh, just um, following up on that, I was also part of the room. We also talked about um, whether to call things out like this, like in a, in say a meeting or in an email thread or outside. And um, we kind of concluded that it depends on whether we think it's intentional or, or malicious. And if it's malicious, maybe calling it out right away is the best way forward, or if it could be unintentional, maybe assuming that and then addressing the person outside, in addition to like some public statement on a different thread would, would be the way forward. Yeah, thank you, Kendra. Um, I was gonna, uh, yeah, so, so Piv mentioned um, asking uh, everyone who is comfortable doing so to include pronouns in either their email signature or at least bring up that discussion, which I think is a really good idea. Um, and then, yeah, um, I think in general, um, the public, some sort of public, uh, we can all agree that some sort of public action address of this issue is needed so that, again, we don't take, we don't, uh, we don't, we don't, we make sure that folks realize that this is not normal behavior. I think that's 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 an important point to remember. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Does anyone else have any uh, other thoughts on this issue or concerns? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of this meeting, so I've not read the scenario. But just from the discussion, I think probably um, there is something about creating social norms. So almost doing it publicly might be awkward. But if that means that from then on that group understands that that's not what you do in that group, um, I think that can be quite a powerful force. But I think it's quite a difficult balance between wanting to sort of change the social norms of a group and at the same time not wanting to cause more awkwardness than discomfort than is necessary. I just think that sometimes discomfort is worth putting up with discomfort to change the social norms. Thank you, Georgia. What do folks think about that? Can I add one thought? Um, I I love that we we make the effort to change social norms, but also it's important to remember that if we force people to choose, if they're trans and they're not out, then we're forcing them potentially to choose the wrong pronoun and to tell everyone, hey, this is the wrong pronoun. Uh, so it's, it's it's important not to force people to share things if they're not comfortable with it. Thank you, Yo. Yeah, but I I I think I understand <laughs> what you what the sort of your line of thinking there, Georgia. I think um, yeah, I had a very personal experience with that last year, um, running a um, a OLF light call um, that someone decided to do something, and another participant reflected that it was very powerful that that person decided to do that and made them reflect on you know, whether they would like to speak out in the future. I hope I got that sort of right, but but it is it is always good to be aware of the consequences that your actions may have in terms of the social norms of the group. Um, okay, uh, so scenario two, um, we have two groups, just to check this time. Um, so the text is as follows. At a meeting, a person with a moderate proficiency in English makes a suggestion, but no one picks up on it. Later, another person with high proficiency in English makes the same suggestion and is given credit for it. What would you do as an ally? So um, maybe we could have the spoken uh, group, uh, so group five, if you could please summarize um, what you've discussed. Oh, hello, I think it's me. <laughs> so uh, I won't turn my camera on because it's a bit iffy today. Um, we we talked um, about the fact that um, the assumption was that if uh, a person that doesn't speak um, English um, fluently uh, doesn't really know much, doesn't have a, doesn't know the point, isn't giving a good point which obviously is completely wrong. Um, and uh, I, I said that I had actually experienced this in not in um, 
uh, way of language, but that fact that I had been in a, a group of me being the only female in a male dominated leadership group where I had some very good suggestions when I was a junior member, but I'd been completely spoken over and they had completely taken my ideas actually in the future and run with them and ignore the credit, which was not amazing for me. Um, and so we talked a bit about that, that um, it would be great to speak up about that and have an ally on your side. But we really talked about whether it was good to do that in the moment or whether it's better to do that after it had happened. And I think we came to the conclusion that it depended um, on the situation. So if you were in like a conference or a one-off meeting, it would be something that you would have to do in that particular moment because otherwise you might not see those people again. You might not be able to actually make that influence on those people. But actually, if it was something that happened to you in um, a regular meeting in your workplace, then it would be something that you could deal with afterwards because then it could be brought up in a future meeting. So maybe that would be easier than the confrontational way of doing it in the moment. Um, I hope that for everyone. Harriet, does that summarise what we talked about? So I can see you just nod or wave at me. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. Good. <laughs> that was us, I think. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Emma. Thank you for, for the group, to the group. Um, I'll try and uh, point, uh, summarize a bit what the written room has discussed as well. Um, so the level of English, uh, the, some of the assumptions is that uh, the level of English is somehow related to the level of understanding of perceived intelligence. Um, and that I think the group re realized that they were projecting their own experiences and biases in the severity of the scenario. Sorry, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if you could elaborate a bit on that, um, either with the Google Doc uh, or in the Zoom chat or verbally. Um, that would help. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I. Um, I also, I, we also noticed one, one statement that uh, this group has written um, about stepping up as an ally, undermining the ability for the person to stand up for oneself. I'm wondering if this person would be comfortable um, sharing a bit more sort of the, the thinking behind that. Um, either, again, either by typing um, in either the Zoom chat or the Google Doc or you can unmute yourself. So, I mean, maybe if I can add to clarify the, the point about our experiences and our own biases. Uh, for instance, in the beginning, we were talking a bit about how, how we, would, we would manage and how we would credit the situation. And we couldn't really decide at what level to take it. For instance, if the, if the credit was completely taken from one person uh, and how much of the idea was indeed generated by one or the other. Uh, if, if the whole situation was extremely unfair to the first, or it was still something manageable uh, in the context. And so at some point we realized that this probably happened to a lot of us in the, in the, in the group. And so we were kind of bringing back that reflection to the, to the discussion. This is what, I, what we were referring to there. I see, yeah, that's very clear. Thank you, Renato. Um, yeah, I think I think we chose this particular scenario. Sorry, if 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 there was another point that I've uh, asked for a clarification, but if it's only if you're comfortable. If not, uh, if you are, then please keep typing. If you're typing, um, yeah, I, I think I think we chose this particular scenario because it's one that I think is close to a lot of us here at OLS. Uh, um, folks speaking uh, various uh, English at various proficiencies. I'm not a first language English speaker myself. Um, and um, yeah, it, it is, you know, the, 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 um, there are some good discussions about whether or not it could be addressed at, at the point and, or you should be uh, waiting until later. But I think it's important to, uh, as the written group has, has acknowledged that, you know, speaking up in the language that one is not super proficient in is difficult and folks that are higher, highly proficient tend to speak more in comparison. Um, 
it is important that people know that they are heard. Um, if I'm repeatedly ignored, then I will feel like my contribution is not valued and will stop speaking. And so we really need to give the right credit so to encourage people to keep speaking. And then one final point I want to make, I'm aware that I'm <laughs> close to time, um, is that if you are a facilitator of meeting, please make sure that you pay attention to the amount uh, that people are speaking, not only in terms of time, people speak at different speeds and different um, uh, other factors may affect the amount of time that they actually speak. So it's about giving equitable opportunities for everyone to speak. Um, try to gently turn for opinions from those who haven't had a chance to share their thoughts and always acknowledge inputs by trying to give the correct credits and um, yeah, repeating uh, a summary or paraphrase of suggestions. So I hope that was, a, yeah, again, a, a, a meaningful discussion for uh, us and we'll keep thinking about these issues. And um, can I quickly comment on that, Emmy? Uh, yeah. Just want to remind what Hao said in the beginning, your action doesn't need to be really strong or challenging. It could be as simple as, oh, I heard from the person X already. Can we hear back again? It doesn't have to be you being a savior for them. So it's not that by being an ally, you're demeaning someone's effort. You're actually making space for them to speak for themselves. So don't think about that you're undermining someone by being an ally. Think about ways you can empower people around you. Thank you, Malvika. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, this, how do you have anything else to, to add? Not at the moment. Uh, thank you. That was a great, uh, great summary. Thank you, everyone. Um, with that, I think I will pass to. Um, some notes about the next call. <laughs> I can grab this. Um, so our next call is next week. Apologies for having a cohort call in the middle and normally this is a bit of a rest week, um, but we will have our next call on November 5th. It will be about FAIR related issues. And hopefully you've already had a mentor meeting or will later this week as well. One last thing I'm really going to quickly pop in the chat is if you found this valuable and you think anyone else you know might be might find this valuable. We're actually running a session um, in December for Ally Skills and this is actually partly to also gain money to raise money for OLS for the cohorts. Uh, so if you know anyone who might be able to consider registering and perhaps their organization could pay then please do share that link. And I'm really sorry that I ended up this up with uh, please give us money is the last thing in the call. No, but just to iterate, it's free for anybody who's part of OLS. So it's not to grab money out of you. So you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Malvika. <laughs> I think we're good. Thank you so much, everyone. And huge round of applause and thanks for Emmy and Hal for helping co-host this. Yeah, rich friends, bring them on. <laughs>